Hello, here we are with the Julian chapter. We're in chapter 19, and it is Grandmama's story. I was a very popular girl when I was young, Julian, said Grandmama. I had many friends. I had pretty clothes, as you can see. I have always liked pretty clothes. She waved her hands down her sides to make sure I noticed her dress. She smiled. I was a frivolous girl, she continued, spoiled. When the Germans came to France, I hardly took any notice. I knew that some Jewish families in my village were moving away, but my family was so cosmopolitan. My parents were intellectuals, atheists, we didn't even go to synagogue. She paused here and asked me to bring her a wine glass, which I did. She served herself a full glass and, as she always did, offered me some too. And as I always did, I said, no, merci. Like I said, mom would go ballistic if she knew the stuff Grandma Mare did sometimes. There was a boy in my school called well, they called him Turto, she continued. He was, how do you say the word, a crippled? Is that how you say it? I don't think people use that word anymore, Grandma Mare, I said. It's not exactly politically correct, if you know what I mean. She flipped her hand at me. Americans are always coming up with new words we can't say anymore, she said. Alors. Well, Turto's legs were deformed from the polio. He needed two canes to walk with, and his back was all twisted. I think that's why he was called Turto, crab. He walked sideways like a crab. I know it sounds very harsh. Children were meaner in those days. I thought about how I called August the freak behind his back but at least I never called him that to his face. Grandma Mare continued talking. I have to admit, at first I wasn't into her telling me one of her long stories, but I was getting into this one. Turto was a little thing, a skinny thing. None of us ever talked to him because he made us uncomfortable. He was so different. I never even looked at him. I was afraid of him, afraid to look at him, to talk to him, afraid he would accidentally touch me. It was easier to pretend he didn't exist. She took a long sip of her wine. One morning, a man came running into our school. I knew him, everyone did. He was a Maquis, a Partisan. Do you know what that is? He was against the Germans. He rushed into the school and told the teachers that the Germans were coming to take all the Jewish children away. What? What is this? I could not believe what I was hearing. The teachers in the school went around to all the classes and gathered the Jewish children together. We were told to follow the Maquis into the woods. We were going to go hide. Hurry, hurry, hurry. I think there were maybe 10 of us in all. Hurry, 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 escape. Grandma Mare looked at me to make sure I was listening, which of course I was. It was snowing that morning and very cold. And all I could think of was, if I go into the woods, I will ruin my shoes. I was wearing these beautiful new red shoes that Papa had brought me, you see. As I said before, I was a frivolous girl, perhaps even a little stupid, but this is what I was thinking. I did not even stop to think, well, where is Mama and Papa? If the Germans were coming for the Jewish children, had they come for the parents already? This did not occur to me. All I could think about were my beautiful shoes. So instead of following the Maquis into the woods, I snuck away from the group and went to hide inside the bell tower of the school. 
There was a tiny room up there, full of crates and books, and there I hid. I remember thinking I would go home in the afternoon after the Germans came and tell Mama and Papa all about it. This is how stupid I was, Julian. I nodded. I couldn't believe I had never heard the story before. And then the Germans came, she said. There was a narrow window in the tower and I could see them perfectly. I watched them run into the woods after the children. It did not take them very long to find them. They all came back together. The Germans, the children, the Maquis soldier. Grandma Mare paused and blinked a few times and then she took a deep breath. They shot the Maquis in front of all the children, she said quietly. He fell so softly, Julian, in the snow. The children cried. They cried as they were led away in a line. One of the teachers, Mademoiselle Patagine, went with them, even though she was not Jewish. She said she would not leave her children. No one ever saw her again, poor thing. By now, Julian, I had awakened from my stupidity. I was not thinking of my red shoes anymore. I was thinking of my friends who had been taken away. I was thinking of my parents. I was waiting until it was nighttime so I could go home to them. But not all the Germans had left. Some had stayed behind along with the French police. They were searching the school. And then I realized they were looking for me. Yes, for me and for the one or two other Jewish children who had not gone into the woods. I realized then that my friend Rachel had not been among the Jewish children who were marched away, nor Jacob, a boy from another village who all the girls wanted to marry because he was so handsome. Where were they? They must have been hiding, just like I was. Then I heard creaking, Julian, up the stairs. I heard footsteps up the stairs coming closer to me. I was so scared. I tried to make myself as small as possible behind the crate and hid my head beneath a blanket. Here, Grandma Mare covered her head with her arms as if to show me how she was hiding. And then I heard someone whisper my name. She said, it was not a man's voice. It was a child's voice. Sarah, the voice whispered again. I peeked out from the blanket. Torturo, I answered, astonished. I was so surprised because in all the years I had known him, I don't think I had ever said a word to him, nor him to me, and yet, there he was, calling my name. They will find you here, he said. Follow me. And I did follow him, for by now I was terrified. He led me down a hallway into the chapel of the school, which I had never really been to before. We went to the back of the chapel, where there was a crypt. All this was new to me, Julian, and we crawled through the crypt so the Germans would not see us through the windows because they were looking for us still. I heard when they had found Rachel. I heard her screaming in the courtyard as they took her away. Poor Rachel. Totoro took me down to the basement beneath the crypt. There must have been 100 steps at least. These were not easy for Totoro as you can imagine, with his terrible limp and his two canes, but he hopped down the steps two at a time, looking behind him to make sure I was following. Finally, we arrived at a passage. It was so narrow we had to walk sideways to get through. And then we were in the sewers, Julian. Can you imagine? I knew instantly because of the smell, of course. We were knee deep in refuse. You can imagine the smell. 
so much for my red shoes. We walked all night. I was so cold, Julian. Turo was such a kind boy, though. He gave me his coat to wear. It was, to this day, the most noble act anyone has ever done for me. He was freezing, too, but he gave me his coat. I was so ashamed for the way I had treated him. Oh, Julian, I was so ashamed. She covered her mouth with her fingers and swallowed. Then she finished the glass of wine and poured herself another. The sewers led to Danavilliers, a small village about 15 kilometers away from Aubervilliers. Mama and Papa had always avoided this town because of the smell. The sewers from Paris drained onto the farmland there. We wouldn't even eat apples grown in Den Elevers, but it's where Turo lived. He took me to his house and we cleaned ourselves by the well and then Turo brought me to the barn behind his house. He wrapped me up in a horse blanket and told me to wait. He was going to get his parents. No, I pleaded, don't tell them. I was so frightened, I wondered if when they saw me, they would call the Germans, you know. I had never met them before. But Totoro left, and a few minutes later, he returned with his parents. They looked at me. I must have seemed quite pathetic there, all wet and shivering. The mother, Vivian, put her arms around me to comfort me. Oh, Julian. That hug was the warmest hug I had ever felt. I cried so hard in this woman's arms because I knew then, I knew I would never cry in my own mama's arms again. I just knew it in my heart, Julian. And I was right. They had taken mama that same day along with all the other Jews in the city. My father, who had been at work, had been warned that the Germans were coming and managed to escape. He was smuggled to Switzerland, but it was too late for Mama. She was deported that day to Auschwitz. I never saw her again. My beautiful Mama. She took a deep breath here and shook her head. And that's the end of chapter 19.